She was fairly free with the information, Merkiner explained. She did not try to hide anything, did not bother making excuses. I did not even get the sense she was lying or leading me on. She was just upset. Everything had to be interpreted through tears. Osmara seemed absent, but only because her attention was so focused. She could not spare any fragment of her mind because it would not entertain the impossibility that her daughter was dead. Her extreme focus rendered her capable of concentration on only one matter, one task at a time, and this slowed the discussion. The company she kept did not hold this against her, but permitted her every ounce of their patience. She was still listening. Merkiner continued talking. She works in the stables, knows almost everyone. She is friends with Cassandra, apparently a rumor well known among the soldiers. She said Sergeant Shem arrived in Runa yesterday, alone. He is the one who started it, Merkiner addressed it suspiciously, as a rumor. His mother had already turned on him earlier when he treated it with sincerity, and he understood that, for her sanity, it needed to be disproved. He slumped into the settee beside her armchair, exhausted from the hike to and from the dungeons. Lunarier poured his brother a cup of tea from the metal pot on the short table between the chairs. It should not have been his job, but someone needed to pour and no butler was permitted for fear of disclosure. Only the royal family and those in attendance who actually held the title of duke or general were permitted in. No subordinate was allowed to substitute for their master's absence tonight. It was not merely a political matter, but also a personal one, and would be treated as such. I want him here, Osmara seethed. No one argued, only traded their pitying glares to one another. Bring him to me. It was an order, but ambiguous as to whom would execute the command. The elderly female general who had arrested Melanie presumed the objective. Your Highness, did the prisoner detail the location of the sergeant? He was in Runa yesterday, but he may have already fled, Merkiner posed. He lives with his mother, on the trail to Samsane just beyond the Iman Woods. The general of the Order of Diadra, Shem's order, supplied. It is far enough for a day's travel, and I cannot imagine that he would not pay his respects to her if he did leave. I will dispatch a squad immediately, the female general announced. No, Michelle, Osmar cut her off. I want him here now, and I will not wait another moment. She stood up, and all those who sat in attendance immediately sprung to their feet. She stalked around the low table between the sofas and turned a long silver key from her belt over to her elder son. Merkiner, go to the aviary and present this key to the mistress of the muse. We will retire to the observatory rotunda in the temple tower. Meet us there. Merkiner bowed, retreated to the door, and snapped his fingers at a general to command an escort. They departed. Three words were all it took but he understood her meaning implicitly. He had known Melanie since she started working at the castle. He knew about her indiscretion and tendency to prattle, but it never bothered him. He had worked at the castle for so long that nothing she could say could besmirch his character. He had a content life complete with spouse and spawn, and intended to remain content. His ambitions were average, and so he was neither admired by those in, nor would advance to, a more prestigious post. He was happy with this because he only wanted to be sure to keep his name clean and his purse and belly full. He could retire at the end of the day proud of his work and ready to be proud of it again tomorrow. Three words, it is true, were all it took to change that. Tomorrow was suddenly less certain than it had been yesterday, and it threatened him with an empty belly and an empty purse, neither of which he was content with. He would have to break out of his patterns to keep them full, and that meant figuring out new ways to old problems. That would entail thinking about problems. And he did not like to think about problems. He liked to think about happy things. Love, retirement, friends. Friends help one another. Perhaps she was not a friend like some of the soldiers with whom he worked, but with three words she helped prepare him for the upcoming loss of his contentment. For this he was grateful, because he figured he could now try to stop it and it was gratuity that led him down the spiral stairwell into the cellar of the armory tower. Broad, boring columns stood in long, solemn rows. The network of arches that bridged the capital supported the flight of barracks floors above. The air was cold and damp. Seawater seeped through the bedrock floor to pool in the crevices and lick every texture with a glossy sheen. 
He had brought a lantern. Certain no spare sconce would be lit for the company kept in this cellar. The row of columns nearest the wall were fitted with partitions of wood, grills of iron, or walled off completely to inter those whose presence in reality was considered a mistake. Macer crept along the dungeon cells, his light carving what it could from the dark. It caught in the eyes of the culprits who cowered in their corners, but lured almost none to do more than moan. Occasionally a curse was spat, or pleading heard, but none from the voice he sought, the one that had said just three little words. He would have to call out to her first. Melanie? He tried in a whisper, then again in a more reserved, less desperate tone, as though testing the air with her name. Melanie. May, sir? The sound was an echo in the dark. It could have come from anywhere. They played their game again, groping blindly for one another with their hails. Her cries cracked when she could distinguish his features by the lantern light. His voice sighed when he fell to his knees to knot his fingers with hers. Are you all right? I'm fine. What are you doing here? You must have made some scene. The castle is bristling with activity. I told the soldiers why, and word is spreading like wildfire. Most of the castle's human staff have deserted their posts. They have shipped off. Orders have just been given to detain those still at the castle. I did not want you left behind. Me, sir, no. Go. Get out of here. You are coming with me. I'm going to get you out. Melanie was kept in a pen two columns wide behind a lattice of square wooden beams fastened with iron. The key? she queried. Right here. Macer chimed and illuminated the wedge and hammer he carried in his other hand. The padlock's hoop was shortly cracked and the chain untangled from the door. He pulled her up and hand in hand they ran. Their leather soles shuffled loudly against the stone stairs. There was no banister to crutch their climb and their thighs seized and burned away from their awkward limping up the spiraling stairs. Macer slowed their ascent as he approached the cracked door and he leaned forward to peek at their proposed escape. Step lively he hissed, and walked out. They dared not run. It would have caught too much attention. Melanie nearly clipped his heels with every desperate hurried step. She clung closer behind him than even his shadow. Guards passed, but his armor and her uniform were sufficient to disguise them. Their escape of the armory tower went unnoticed. They snuck across the playing field and the courtyard at the foot of the keep, and out through the gatehouse that loomed between the inner and outer curtains of the castle. They called it the official city, a neighborhood of summer homes and resort residences maintained by the nobility for their visits to the royal court, but usually occupied by constables and secretaries in the noble service. The architecture in this district was artistic. Stacks of arcades and porches with iron balustrades overlooked gardens of stone that bloomed statues and tiered fountains, and all of it laced with vines overgrown with flowers and fruits. Swirling iron arms stretched lanterns over the alleys to spot them with lights. The contrast between their glow and the dark sky detailed just how long she had been imprisoned. Whereas the sun had only begun to rise when she had entered the castle, she escaped to an orange dusk on a horizon that could barely breach the battlements. Most of the sky's dome had already succumbed to the night's purple palette. They scurried through the alleys and ducked themselves into cutouts and corners, dodging as best they could the spots of light. The clatter of carts driving over the cobblestones stilled them in the shadows. They waited for the wagons to pass, then dashed across the avenues to navigate away to the lower rings of the city, closer to the outer gatehouse. A long bay window of successive lancets built into the story above the broad arched doorway helped incorporate and disguise the gatehouse among the mansions. Only the twin towers flanking the gate gave it away. There were two sets of double doors. The city side doors were open, and the people milling in the tunnel beyond were torchlit. The port side doors were closed, save for a wicked gate through which two guards were filing the departing crowd. An escape was still possible. Melanie and Macer slunk in among the others, housekeeping staff, dressed down soldiers, secretaries and couriers. The crowd's greed to leave first muddled the order of their escape, and they displaced one another until all that remained was a meandering mass that the two sentries needed to siphon into a single queue. The wicked gate built into the port side door could only accommodate one body at a time, and lining up made boarding the dock boat significantly easier. In all the times Melanie had previously passed through that wicket, she never rushed to the front. Delays made for more time to prattle with a scullery boy or maid. 
Macer's hand clenched to her wrist, and her heightened pulse convinced her, however, that this was a time to fight for a space further ahead. Lazier souls, like hers, were the first surpassed, followed by those with middle-class mentalities whom passive-aggressively permitted cutting so long as the decency of their gesture was acknowledged. Closer to the door, however, everyone became tense and debated the order of escape in pompous and occupying postures. None, however, would tolerate the usurping of those already lined up, as then the whole process would cease and no one would get out. Eventually the sentries came with strong hands to grip their shoulders and guide Melanie and Macer into place. Macer fought against a sneer at being so forcefully handled by these whelps. The door was being worked by children, which is not even half his age, who could not begin to consider his seniority to them in decency or experience. He let it go, not wanting to create a scene. Their every waddle closer to the door relieved the tension of their breaths until at last they could steal deep, free, fresh gasps of the salt sea air outside the castle's gate. The shore along the wall was an embankment of rocks, a lithic palisade that jutted sharp shards at the tide. The waning day had already shifted the currents, and churning waves beat rather than lapped the pilings. The pier could have docked any number of vessels. Currently, however, there was only one barge tied at its end. They marched toward it. Behind them the line was severed, ending long before the gatehouse was empty of potential passengers. The next person to pass through the door was a soldier. His black, silver-scrolled armor permitted his passing up to the other's place in line. Melanie and Macer choked as he walked by, afraid their breaths might make him notice them. He walked directly to the barge without so much as a second glance at any of the people waiting to board. Ahead where the ship was stationed, the pier suddenly grew crowded. Behind, one of the teenaged gatekeepers was turning people around and inviting them back into the gatehouse. They dismissed, then argued with the sentry, who only continued repeating the reason they needed to return. The ship is being ordered to anchor. The island is being sequestered. You will be kept safe inside the castle. Melanie kept flicking glances between Macer and the argument at the end of the line. Macer kept very still, tried to ignore everything, as though waiting in line might still help them escape. The crowd at the end of the pier had been herded all the way back to where Melanie and Macer stood. They were being pushed back toward the gatehouse. Its sentry became distracted by trying to siphon the crowd through the wicked gate, while also commanding his companion to open the doors. She could not make out a suggestion, and the congestion grew. Melanie now took Macer's arm and dropped from the pier to the jutting rocks below. The black boulders rolled and clattered beneath their feet as Melanie teased Macer to follow. "'Where are we heading?' he asked. "'The postern gate,' she answered. "'It's reserved. There may still be a boat we can take.' They crawled along the embankment, supporting themselves on their hands and braiding their ankles as they sidestepped along the rocky shore. The shadow of the castle disguised them as they maneuvered around the piled boulders, but also obscured their sight of the next spall to which they could cling. Blind, they groped for a path, testing each rock before pulling themselves on. There were places where the stones drained into a nearly sandy shore, and other places where the castle's curtain wall was built right up to the water. They were forced to wade in the sea before clambering back onto the rocks. They arrived at the base of the postern gate's tower, sopping and cold, and pulled themselves up to its dock where they huddled outside the locked door to catch their breath. "'Do you know how to sail?' Macer asked. "'No. Do you?' Macer walked to a small overturned boat. "'I can recall some basics. I have not bothered running a sail since I was a boy.' "'We could row,' Melanie pointed out as Macer rolled the vessel over. He pushed it to the dock's edge, then fought against its weight to let it slip slowly into the water. Macer guffawed before his retort. With these waves, we would die of exhaustion before we made it back to Runa. We cannot stay here, Melanie pointed out. Really, it's all right, Macer said, helping her into the dinghy. Look, take the rudder and hold it steady for now. I will play with the sails once we have rowed clear of the rocks. He sat her down, stood at the stern, and punted them out to sea with an oar. Once adrift, Melanie fussed with the oar ties, and Macer rowed the boat out to open water. The ambient orange glow that had hummed on the horizon had drained completely away from the black night. Water slammed against the boat's side, but Melanie's firm hand on the rudder and the pull in the sails Macer haphazardly cast from the erected mast fought back. It was not the fastest progress they figured they could make, but was sufficient to get them moving across the water. Two patches of light guided their way those from the castle behind them, and those from Runa ahead. The moon, rising above them, they attempted to ignore, 
and they would have succeeded were it not for a strange drift of shadows silhouetted against its glow. Maser, what is that? He joined Melanie, scouring the sky for details. Lower than the clouds they flew, bodies not unfamiliar, limbs and proportions practically human, sailing themselves on breezes caught in outstretched wings.